Hello, welcome to the second half of the welcome lecture. Now I want to focus a little bit more about the course itself. And so, um, so the, the material is part of a course that I teach at the University of Michigan called SI502, which is Network Communi Computing, Storage, Communication, and Processing. I also have some of these materials. It's also got Python in it. I don't have any Python in this class. There's no programming. So it's really just part of this uh, intro, intro technology class that I teach at the University of Michigan. Um, it's sort of taught in the middle. I give students a break between the Python programming. Um, and so this is a, a short message from our, our lawyers, and this is on the uh, certificates or something like this is on the certificates that basically says this is not a University of Michigan course. It doesn't count for credit at the University of Michigan. It's a free course, and it's for you to learn. It's not so much about credit. And so uh, enough of that. When I uh, got involved in Coursera, and I was... I wasn't the earliest, but I was one of the early folks in Coursera, and what I wanted to create was like a freshman class, like an introductory class, like a class where we all come together and kind of get to know each other and learn something kind of fun and, and uh, really enjoy getting started together. And I think there are other classes in Coursera that are more sophomore, junior, and senior level courses, but I wanted to be on early and have some writing involved in it and explore the software. To get, and I want people to take my course and then go off and take other Coursera courses as well, well as other courses. Because I think a big part of education is getting to know people and getting socialized and, and understanding how an environment worked. And I uh, have a long history of open source software development. And one thing about open source software development is He's supposed to be open to suggestions and other and let other people other than me make decisions about the course. And so I encourage you to, you know, to contribute to the course, to give me suggestions, to tell me how I can improve the course. Uh, sometimes I even explicitly ask you for uh, help on exam questions or help to uh, come up with better homework questions, all kinds of things. Um, I really like it when you take care of each other. A big part of these large classes is that the learning becomes more social. You can help each other faster than I can help you. Uh, our community teaching assistants, they can help you as well. So I tend to wait and let you guys solve your problems and help each other. And then I sort of sort of pat people on the back and tell people that they're, tell people if something's wrong, I'll, I'll try to fix it. But um, but in general, I really want us to learn together. So the, uh, the backbone of the course is lectures, um, recorded audio lectures. Hey, like this one. Um, I give you the lecture notes in PDF, with two formats of PDF. The print one is designed, if you're going to print these out on paper, the slides are smaller and there's four per page and they don't use up as much color ink. And I also give you the PowerPoint so that you can either modify them or some people use PowerPoint to scribble on. And um, you, uh, you, the slides are Creative Commons by attribution, and so you can use them and reuse them in your own teaching. And that's why I give you PowerPoint, so you can modify them. Most of the videos are up on YouTube. You can point at them. Um, I don't want you to put copies of my videos up on YouTube. You're allowed to download them. Um, some of the videos are copy, have copyright IEEE material in them, so you really can't do anything except use them in, for the purposes of this class and for your own purple, per, personal use, and they belong to IEEE, and they remain copyright IEEE. Of course, you can use them in your own teaching. You know That's, that's totally fair. It's just... The key is not to republish the material. So if you borrow my slides, they're totally republishable. So um, the classes, <clears throat> you know, eight, nine, ten weeks long with some exams. The syllabus has the uh, the detail. I, I expect this to be, um, I, it's not like a three-credit college class. I expect three to four focused hours of your time per week, maybe five or two or more, two more hours or so, depending. Um, and I'm going to make it so that in the first two weeks, we're not moving so fast that people can't still join. So I kind of give the assignments a little longer in the first couple of weeks and give people a bit of time to catch up. But if you have people that you want to join the class, you got to get them in early. And so we'll shut down new enrollment at some point, um, and people won't be able to join the class, and you know maybe about three weeks in or something, and then off we go, and we'll be a cohort. A uh, big part of the class is the discussion forums, and uh, this is both where you meet and find each other. Uh, Coursera classes often have very active and great discussions in the forums. Um, you folks come from all over the world. Um, there are thousands of people in the class, thousands of people active, and, uh, and I really get a great deal of joy 
interacting with uh, all of you, and uh, regardless of, of where you're coming from, I think that's particularly fun. One of the things that I've taken to doing, because I have a very active travel schedule as a faculty member here at the University of Michigan, I do lots of speaking engagements about MOOCs and open source software and Sakai and standards and all the things that I do, I, get, I, I, I end up on a plane a lot. So one of the things I like to do is take a, a couple hours out and uh, announce to the students in the class, announce to you that, oh, hey, I'll be in Barcelona, Spain for uh, from you know 10 to noon on a Saturday morning. And then uh, people come by, and I've had these all over the world, New York, Los Angeles, Michigan, North Carolina, Chicago, D.C., Seoul, Korea, Barcelona. I've had them all over the world. And usually somewhere between 2 and 15 people show up, and it's, uh, it's great fun. And so I would love, if uh, I end up doing office hours, if uh, you will show up at office hours. The uh, way that you earn your grade is through assessments. There are questions that stop in the middle of the video. They do not count. So it doesn't really matter if you get them right or wrong. There'll be one quiz to cover each week's worth of material. That'll be worth 10 points in the final exam. Um, the quizzes you can take over and over and over again, and hopefully your score goes up each time you take. You get to keep the, the last score. I think it's the last score. The final exam is a little different, and I'll send notes out about this. It's one attempt. You have 24 hours, but you have 24 hours within a two-week period. Once you start it, you have to finish it within 24 hours. Um, so you don't get to take it over and over and over again. And there's three extra credit assignments uh, that are peer graded for writing, so they're 10 points each. Now you don't have to do the extra credit. You'll see in a bit that the, the, the points are based on the percentage of the points for the quiz plus the final exam. So peer grading is a way for you to, if you like, to engage more deeply in the material and engage more deeply in your fellow students. The extra credit material is peer graded, but you don't have to do it. Your peers will determine your grade. Now, the way it works is the high ones and the low ones are thrown out, so it's the middle ones. And so if somebody gives you zeros, unless everyone gives you zeros, you'll get the score, the middle score, not the high nor the low. It's not an average. So you get some low scores. Those low scores are basically thrown away. And so you've got to write your submission knowing that it's your fellow students that are going to judge you. I'm not going to come in with thousands of assignments and regrade them if you disagree with the grading. So you got to write with your audience in mind. And so in the course, if you get, not including the extra credit, the extra credit is just added on, but basically the total for the assignments plus the total for the exam is how I'm going to calculate the course percentage. So I take the total you learn earn on the assignments, 10 a week, total on the exam, say if the exam was 30, so there's seven assignments, times 10, 30, and then so 7 times 10 and 30, in this case 100 is the denominator, and then we add to that on the numerator, we add the extra credit. So if you don't do the extra credit at all, you have up to 100 points, right, and 100 points, 100%. The extra credit, and you might not get a 10 on every one of the extra credits, but the extra credit is just extra credit, it's added on. And so after I do this calculation, I guess we clear this here, after I do this calculation right here, that percentage, which might be over 100% if you've done extra credit assignments, if you're above 75%, you're going to get a certificate, and if you're above 85%, you get a certificate with distinction. Now, if you really want a certificate, don't plan on getting exactly 75% or 74.99%, and then do a bunch of complaining. Okay? This is about learning, but if you want to get the certificate, don't shoot for the low level. Or the same thing. If you end up with 84.99, you know, don't I, just earn the certificate, get the points, don't let it be close. Okay? So 85, uh, 75% for a certificate, 85% for a certificate with distinction. And there will be no individual regrades or point appeals, or if you think your peers are completely confused and misgraded you. Just do the next assignment, right? So that's part of the reason that I made peer grading extra credit. So as I mentioned, you're supposed to help each other. And you'll help each other a lot. I mean, the questions in the forums in one class get answered 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, an average of 21 minutes. And that's because often the people who know the answers to your question best 
are maybe even the time, same time zone as you are and taking the class at exactly the same time you are. So ask the questions in the forum. The answers will often come in the forum. Um, and on the quizzes, if you have some confusion or you have some clarification that you need, talk about it. You know, the, the people who could just sit and take the quizzes over and over and eventually get 10 out of 10. So we don't think of the quizzes as highly sensitive material. I mean, you tend not to just put all the quiz questions in and your answers into the form. That would be tacky. But, you know, just if somebody has a problem with question seven and there's some confusion, you know, don't worry about being highly sensitive or secure about it. Say, oh, I'm having problems with question seven, and I think that C is the answer, but I don't quite understand why packets aren't also streams or something like that. So the, qu the quizzes are designed often to have thought questions, and so in the curiosity that goes around solving some of the quiz questions, you can, can learn some. Um, plagiarism it is an important thing in this course. The place where this pops up is in the writing part, the peer the peer grading. And my definition of plagiarism is basically taking material verbatim without sort of re-expressing it and pasting it in as if it were your own material without attri attribution. So you, you can put a little quote in, but you got to put it in quotes and say, blah, 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 Winston Churchill or whatever. Okay, so it's, it's not plagiarism to put something in. It's plagiarism to put something in and claim it as though you wrote it. The most common thing is, is People will start taking paragraphs in, from Wikipedia and putting them in, and we will mark them off. Um, we will mark half off if there's a little bit of uh, plagiarism, and if it's all plagiarized, then you get 10 off. Now, there are going to be five people grading this, and so, you know, one person might think it's plagiarism, and if nobody else does, then, you know, your grade won't be, will reflect what the average or the median person came up with, not what the low person came up with. So... We also have an honor code in the class. The key that this really has to do with the final. You're not supposed to give nor, nor get help on the final. It's open book. It's open notes. It's open network. You can look at the quizzes. You can look at the, uh, the videos. You can do anything you want. What you can't do is just give the questions to somebody else and ask for the answers from them or have them take the test for you. Even on the quiz, you're supposed to pretty much do it yourself, but you can ask people for help if you need some help or clarification on the quiz questions. Again, the quizzes really are more about learning, and the final exam is more about measurement. And like I said, if you get above 75%, you get a statement of accomplishment. There are two levels. One is normal and one with, with distinction, as I mentioned, 75% and 85%. And the syllabus has the exact details on how many points, um, given the total number of points. Um, and that's a statement of accomplishment. And this is at no charge. There is no charge for the statement of accomplishment. If you finish, you get this absolutely at no charge. If, on the other hand, you want something a little nicer, Coursera has a identif identity verification mechanism. So part of the problem with the statement of accomplishment is it says we did not verify your identity at the very bottom, just like that lawyer stuff at the very beginning. And so this small charge for the signature track is because they're going to put some effort into you have to kind of, you know, show them your passport on a camera and they type and they, they do things to figure out who you are and they check to make sure that it's you every time a quiz is being taken. And there's a small charge for this. It is optional, optional, optional. Do not feel you need to do this. Um, if you want it, great. And, and if you're in a situation where you can't financially afford it, there's also scholarships available and you can apply for those at the Coursera site. Now, this is a way for those who can easily afford it, who really don't care and have money to spend, um, it's a way of saying thank you. Uh, I don't exactly know how it's going to work, but someday they tell me I might get a tiny bit of the money from this. I mean, most of it's going to go to Coursera because they're the ones building all of the servers and stuff that we're using for this, which is totally awesome. Um, and some of it goes to University of Michigan, and some goes to little old me at some point, right? And so, so who knows, if you buy one of these things, I might come and buy you a cup of coffee in office hours in Peru someday, if I get to Peru. Um, but don't feel any pressure. I mean, it's it's no big deal. I mean, this is aimed at being free, um, but if you want, you can do this. So I love the fact that it's optional. That's what's beautiful about the signature track. I don't do anything different for signature track. It's not like we have special signature track parties where we all hang out like, oh, welcome to the signature track party. No, it's the same as everybody else, and it's really optional. And it's it gives you a little stronger statement that says, we I verify the identity of this person and the name on this certificate is this actual person. Because you could sign up and call yourself Batman. 
and uh, that would not be good. Uh, but they wouldn't give you a signature track named Batman, unless you really were the Batman. Okay, so I hope you get that. Optional, optional, optional. It's nice, but optional. So, given that there's always thousands of students in the class, it's not really practical to send me direct email. Um, you may find that you'll catch, there's like if you go to drchuck.com, you may actually catch me online where you can talk to me right interactively. Um, the most reliable way to catch me is on Twitter. If you tweet something with at Dr. Chuck in it, usually unless I'm sitting in a meeting, like right now, within five to ten minutes, I will see it on this. So I watch my Twitter very carefully, where no matter where I'm at, all around the world, and if you mention Dr. Chuck, I see it. I want you to contact me if something's wrong, right? If, if question, so what usually happens is I make a quiz and question three has no right answer, and you all figure it out really fast, and they're like, in the forums, there was like, oh, the answer, question three is wrong. Well, somebody needs to tell me question three is wrong. So tweet like, hey, Dr. Chuck, forums are on fire. Question three is wrong. And I go, whoa, and then I go fix it, and that's all calmed down. So when things are broken in the course that I can fix, I want to know about it right away. And so that's what Twitter is good for. Not everyone has to do this in Twitter, but somebody has to notice it and uh, let me know. So as I mentioned, in the first couple of weeks, we're going to have the registration open, but then we're going to close it down. You can watch the first lecture or two and kind of see if you think the course is going to be worthwhile. And if you think it's cool, then bring people. That's people to help you work through it. Um, and so I've tried to make it so that you can join in the first few weeks and still get all the credit. Okay? So you bring your friends, but bring them early. And if they're too late, then they have to register for a later one. We also have a face group. Facebook group for the class. It's totally optional. I didn't make it. I don't run it. I post to it every once in a while. I don't quite know why people do Facebook groups, but they do, and there's one for this course. And so um, we have some materials that I use in this course that I use with permission. Some of the papers that I give you come from IEEE Computer Magazine, and I have permission to use them within this class. That doesn't mean that you have permission to republish them, but you're, you're allowed to use them for the class. Uh, Richard Wiggins, my co-host of the television show, has some materials that I use in class, and I have his permission. And the folks at Open Michigan, open.umich.edu, have helped me in the copyright clearance of my slides and other course materials, which I think is really good. So this, for me, even though we've done it a couple times now, is uh, I'm still curious. I'm still very curious of this form. And so you please help me. You know, give me suggestions. Tell me how to improve this class. You know, I. Um, you can say that it's terrible, that's not too helpful, but if you can say, you know, this would work better if, and sometimes I'll just send you questions and say, hey, how do you think I can improve X, Y, or Z? And so I, I don't think this class is ever at the point where it does not need any more improvement. I'm a big fan of open so or source software and open education resources. My slides are Creative Commons by attribution, and I give them to you in PowerPoint format, so you can edit them, you can use one of them, you can use all of them. I really want to help you, if you're possibly a teacher, to be able to reteach this material or use parts of this material. So I'd be honored if you reused my material. The uh, course videos are available. They're available on YouTube, so you can point to them. I'll give you later a YouTube, when the class finishes, I'll give you a YouTube channel that has them all together bundled up nicely. And if you look, you'll see as each lecture comes out, there's a YouTube link for it. Um, and it's a violation of Coursera terms to take any of the videos like the IEEE video or even my lecture videos. Anything that you get from any Coursera class, you're downloading them for your own personal use. You're not supposed to like make your own YouTube channel from my or anyone else's Coursera course. So if you if we find that you're like trying to make YouTube channels out of Coursera courses, then you kind of get in some trouble. So I do want you to reuse them, right? I want you to, you know, use my stuff in your own classes, but I don't want you to sort of publish your own YouTube channel that is your version of my class. And so, so with that, um, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, welcome to Internet History, Technology, and Security. And up next, we have our first real live lecture. Thanks.